Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Costume Co. I'm extremely excited because I have an amazing guest for you to uh, hear all about the show that she's working on. And her name is Angela Kekic. She's the costume designer for the new uh, series, The Stand. It's a limited series. And uh, I'm really happy to have you here today, Angelina. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very excited to be here to talk about The Stand. Awesome. Um, so anyway, before we get into talking about the stand, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into costume design? Uh, first of all, uh, costumes, fashion have been probably a big part of my life since I was little. Um, I grew up uh, on Vancouver Island in a small Croatian uh culture area and uh, my mom had a lot of friends who were tailors and uh, were sewing and building all kinds of stuff and uh, my mom used to take me to visit them and I was inspired at the age of five or six years old same age as my daughter is and uh, I was like oh I wanted to learn more and more and I started getting into uh, getting fabrics and I started sewing my own little pieces for my dolls and stuff. And I told my mom, I'm like, no more clothes for my dolls. I want you just to bring me scraps of fabric. So then all these sewers used to collect all their fabrics and each month would put in a big bag for me and I would just start making all my own clothes for my dolls. So it started at that age that I became very uh, interested in all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, when I was older, you know, um, my parents wanted me to go to uh, business school and uh, I was my plan was to go and get my uh, bachelor degree in business. And uh, and at, at the last minute, I was talking with my sister and I said, oh, I really I really want to apply uh, to Ryerson and see if I can get into the fashion program. And I know it's not going to make my family happy. But, you know, I, I want to do this. So my sister helped me and uh, I got a phone call from Ryerson saying um, they would like to accept me. And it kind of just all started from there. So I went to Ryerson and ended up doing my degree in uh, design and marketing for four years. And I had an opportunity to work at different fashion houses and meet a lot of amazing people and and work with some amazing instructors at Ryerson University. And then after I finished, I kind of said to myself, well, you know, wh where am I going with this now? I, I knew I loved fashion and I knew I loved costumes. And uh, after that, I decided, okay, I, what is the area I really want to focus on? And I knew I just loved film and theater and I knew that was where my passion was. So. I uh, decided to apply for my master's and then I spent another three years studying costume design at the University of British Columbia, um, where I wrote a thesis and uh, produced a show and all the costumes that came with it. So that's kind of where the beginnings happen. And then I started working in commercials and I spent two years in Vancouver, you know, knocking on every costume designer's door saying, hey, give me a chance. And, you know, one of the first jobs I ever did was, you know, cleaning, um, you know, combat boots for a military show. And, uh, you know, the next show I was I was uh, breaking down in aging leather jackets uh, for a biker show. So, I, you know, I started, you know, um, each step and uh, and then I worked way, way up. Well, actually, you mentioned Ryerson because I actually went to Ryerson as well. And I think um, I thought that was very cool that we happened. What did you think of your time in Toronto uh, being a girl from B.C.? Oh, you know what? I loved right. I loved Ryerson. Um, I love having the nickname Rye High. So you're my, you know, Rye High friend. Yep. Um, and, and to be honest with you, you know, I grew up in a small little town and I moved down to Toronto. I lived on Jarvis and Mutual. Uh, you know, that's a nice area of town. <laughs> yeah, like you know, we're right next to Hooker Harvey's, and exactly. I saw I saw everything, and you know, I lived in a small town with fifty thousand people to three million people in metropolitan Toronto. So it was a huge, you know, difference. I, I came with my flip flops, 
and you know, uh, my boho looked and uh, I realized very quickly that, uh, you know, I, I had to become a Torontonian and I loved every minute of my time at Ryerson. I made some amazing friends. The, um, the instructors that were at Ryerson were awesome. Miss Chu, Professor Chu, uh, Lucia and uh, Dak. Um, and, and one of the things that was the best thing that I ever learned at being at Ryerson was that you had you were on a time limit. I don't know if that was if you had that same experience. Now, I, well, but, I was in the I was across the street in the costume building or okay. in the theater building, I should say. So, oh, but no, for sure they they did the deadlines. It they, was, yeah. yeah, and it was you had a project. And that project was due at two o'clock on the, on a Thursday, and they had a tiny little booth. And if it wasn't in at two o'clock, the doors were shut, and that was the end of it. And they said, "Welcome to the real world." Yeah, uh, you get a zero after that, right? You get a zero, yeah. and that's it. Doesn't matter how hard you work. And they said, "This is what's going to prepare you for what the real world is. If you want to work in fashion." or costumes, film, or whatever, there is a time. And so that was a big eye opener for me. I was always on time, um, but it, it was just, the experience was just amazing. And it taught me a lot and mature uh, and be able to move forward into my career and my passions. Okay, great. Well, I know everyone wants to know about, uh, you've done a lot of shows, but this is a pretty massive show and a huge ensemble of characters. Uh, so was that intimidating for you to tackle this project? To be honest with you? Uh, no, I, uh, I was really excited when this project came up and, uh, I got a phone call and, uh, I got asked, you know, are you, available and i said yes and they're like do you want to come out for the stand and when i had heard who was in the bubble in the stand and who they were hoping to cast for it i was like yes 100 percent and uh you know um to have the opportunity to work with so many professional actors and a lot of these people were uh involved in the show prior to it being made so we're working with Josh and um, so they, they already came in excited and they already had an idea of how they saw their character and how they wanted to develop it. So to me, that was exciting. It wasn't a show where you were like, you didn't know what was going to happen. Everybody that was coming onto this project was excited and very much involved. Yeah. So, um, so besides the book and the script, where do you get most of your, where did you get most of your inspiration from? Um, most of my inspiration basically came from, we basically had 10 weeks uh, prior to going to camera. I worked with a um, visual consultant by the name of Alison Klein. And we basically took the time to look at each of the characters emotionally physically mentally and 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 look at each of the characters and what their arc was so we basically created 500 uh visual boards so when i started josh uh basically sat me down um and said angelina i really want you to take the time to read all nine scripts and i want you to follow each of the each of the characters in their arc. So basically, I looked at pre uh, pandemic to the pandemic happening to their travels to either to Boulder to Vegas, what their lives were like once they arrived to that area, and and then how it ended. So and and again, getting into the um, into their you know the physical sides of their travels the emotional side the the mental side of each of the characters so and we shot uh, episode one and nine first so it was really important that i had an understanding of where we started 
and where we ended. And of course, you know, you're, you're taking a book in my, the book version I have is 1200 pages and we're condensing it down into nine episodes. So it's like this massive feature that's been broken down. And it's really important that we tell a story. And of course, you know, what's one of the best ways to tell a story? And, and that's through uh, costumes. So, uh, you know, within the 10 weeks, we developed all of these boards. I probably spent about 12 hours a day um, sitting there talking with my crew and it was interesting because we would talk about each of the characters and talk about okay for instance harold what mental state is harold in right now how does this affect him you know he's been rejected he's you know doesn't have a, a family anymore the only other person that's alive that he knows is franny who's been in love with for years you know is this his destiny you no know, and how is he going to approach this so again it, that's just a small example of one individual but it was important for us to really understand each character and where their development and journey was going to happen uh, that's awesome. I love hearing that. Um, it's funny because when I talk about costumes versus fashion, I, I oftentimes try to explain that the uh, the character and their arcs uh, oftentimes is conveyed through the costumes. So we'll get to that in a little bit, right? But I wanted to ask you, this is uh, obviously this is a very beloved novel by Stephen King. I'd read, I think it was on social media that he loves this series. He gave it a big thumbs up. Uh, did you work with him? And what? And if you did, what was it like to work with him? Um, so my personal experience with Stephen King, uh, was minimum. Um, for me, I work very closely with Josh Boone and Josh is the one who has the close relationship with Stephen King. So everything that I did went through Josh and then went back to Stephen. But one of the things was, um, we had to figure out how, um, flag was going to be. So that was the one costume. Josh is like, okay, Angelina, this is the one costume that we're going to send to Steven and he's going to approve this costume. So that was my little part with Stephen King. Um, and, and we were also very fortunate. We never received notes from the studio or from Steven, which always means you're doing a really great job. Yeah, that's absolutely, <laughs> I can yeah, imagine. Well, yeah. and also regarding Randall, like, I mean, he's sort of like, um, I guess that was a great starting place too. And then from there, everybody can, you can kind of like expand on the design from that. So when you're dressing the characters, you have many contemporary costumes, but then also some fantasy costumes as well. So how did you approach the design of the contemporary versus the supernatural? Sorry, that's a really uh, long question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I, I guess that the question is asking me how I how I went about, you know, looking at Mother Abigail's world and Flag's world. Okay, so basically, we've got Mother Abigail, who is the voice of God, and we've got Randall Flag, who is basically the voice of evil, right? Dark man, and um, I guess you know. The, most important thing is in this book is this book was written in the 70s and it's also had its first adaptation done in the 90s and so realizing how huge the fan base is for Stephen King is incredible and realizing this is probably his number one book so I've learned a lot over the last year and a half working on this project and the book and analyzing everything. So it was really important for me and the showrunners and the creators of the show that we modernize it. Right. And, you know, it's not 19, it's not the seventies. It's not the ad adaptation that was done in the nineties. You know, it's, it's 2020, you know, we, we made this in 2019 and partially in 2020 and, you know, and we're seeing it now in 2021. So when you think about it, it's, it's taken place over three years and probably an additional seven years on top of that with Whoopi Goldberg, Amber Heard, um, in the development of this. 
So when looking at Mother Abigail's world, she's created this community, this utopian community. And you think about it, 99.4% of the world has died from this pandemic. And you've got these groups of people all having this dream. And they're either dreaming of Mother Abigail or they're dreaming of flag. So, you know, if you're if you're coming and you're doing the travels and you're coming into the world of Boulder, it was really important that we showed that it's a new beginning, it's a new life. And the, you know, and the costumes had to feel real. I never wanted at any time for anyone to go like, oh. Well, that's strange. Or like, why are mm -hmm. they doing this? It, it has to feel real. It has to feel exactly what the world would be like if we were going through it, which we are in a certain way. We're going through this pandemic and we're seeing how people are surviving and dealing with it. And you look at politics right now. Right. You know, you've got uh, you've got people split up in different ways. So when we were looking at Mother Abigail's world, it was important that it felt real. It was important to show, you know, for instance, at the very beginning, when we see in episode one, we see Harold and the team, the body crew, and they basically created these protective costume gears onto themselves, right? They're covering their faces. They're making sure that nothing can get into their skin or they're breathing any of this stuff in. So, and they're, do, and they're making it up as they go, right? They're using their environment and creating these protective gear. And again, a sense of realism and a sense of utilitarian, you know? These people are trying to um, bring a new, new society back together and a community and, and work together on getting light and right now they're using barbecues inside their houses that they've moved into and it's candlelit. So, you know, and showing agings of costumes and, you know, this is not a place where people are changing 24 seven. They're finding something, they're using it, they're working at it and they're working as a community to get this community back up again, a new civilization. We, we come into Flag's world and, you know, uh, you know, I, I was talking with someone else and, and then someone said, well, how do you describe Vegas? And I think to myself, you know, where do you go if you want to go away for a weekend and party or escape reality? You go to Vegas, right? You, you leave your world, you escape everything that's happening around you. And it's almost like this fantasy dream as soon as you arrive. I still remember my first time going to Vegas. I was like 19 or 20. And I just remember it, all the lights and the music and a place that never sleeps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it was important that we showed this world. We want to show people the difference of the type of people that follow Mother Abigail and then the type of people that follow Flag's world. And one of the interesting things with Chris Fisher, our director for episode five and six, he's like, Angelina, I want you really to focus on that these are real people. And this is not a circus. This is not Burning Man. We're not recreating this kind of world. These are real people. So these are people who are teachers, accountants, lawyers, uh, you know, a person who walks, you know, five or six dogs every day, you know, the hairdresser. These are people who, who want to live on the dark side, who want to take advantage of something that they've never been through before and want to live in a world of lust and debauchery. And, you know, working with Aaron Hay, our production designer, who is absolutely fabulous and created these beautiful sets, it was important that we that we complemented. So when you look at Flags World, we've got a lot of blacks and we've got reds and golds and stuff. So it was important for us to, to show that and complement that. And when it was time to start working on these costumes, I remember talking to the production manager and said, okay, well, you know, we live in Vancouver. 
how am I going to dress 500 background and all of these actors? I'm like, this is Vancouver, you know, we're great for Boulder, but we're really not Vegas. And I remember the live producer came in to the off to inside the office and said, well, Angelina, we need to get you on a plane and you're going to Vegas and you're going to LA. And it just, the world just opened up for me. And I spent basically 10 days shopping, 12 hours a day with an amazing crew in Vegas and an amazing crew in Los Angeles. And I was really inspired by vintage pieces and taking those vintage pieces. And we had a huge crew in Vancouver that was building stuff as well. And so we took both, we combined both of those together. And and collaborated that together to um, create the costumes for our background and for our main cast. You know, I I was in I was in an uh, old school costume shop in Las Vegas that had original uh, showgirls costumes from the 1950s. Oh wow! And with you know you know like Swarovski crystals. So it was amazing. So we you know we were able to purchase some of these costumes, and then we would have our team in Vancouver rebuild them. Um, one of the pieces that we had on on Ratwoman um, was a 1940s beaded uh, vest, and um, I fell in love with it. And I'm like, I gotta have this piece. And uh, I hired a beater in Vancouver who spent two weeks rebeating the whole thing uh, for Rat Woman. So it was just, it was, it was a dream come true. And um, I worked with, uh, a, there was a shop in Los Angeles that I fell in love with, um, Glam Squad, and it's in Melrose. And um, I already had these visions of, of headdresses and certain things that I wanted in the show. And I worked with this amazing headdress uh, builder who builds for mostly for Burning Man and a lot of musicians around the world. Uh, his name is Donato. And he worked with me and we built this beautiful four foot headpiece for, for Rat Woman. And uh, yeah, yeah. You shared some of those. Uh, sorry to interrupt. You shared yeah. some of those pictures on Instagram, and and we're shouting them out. I saw that was really cool. Yes, and you know, and they were just they were they were amazing uh, guys at Glam Squad and Cosmo and Donato, and uh, you know they they showed us tons of pieces, and I ended up buying uh, a piece that was all made out of rope and human hair, and I was. I was inspired by this piece and I said, okay, I'm going to take this back to Vancouver and I'm going to re-sculpt it and build a bodice into it and build a bottom. And, you know, and I pitched it to the producers and the showrunner and I, and I pitched it to Fiona who plays rat woman and everybody was on board and uh, it just, it all just started to come together. Right. And so for me, Vegas and Los Angeles inspired me. And I brought I probably back a, a half of a semi truck. I brought probably enough costumes to fit over a thousand backgrounds. And we had about 500 background. So each of our background had a fitting. So nothing was done on set. So each person came in for an actual fitting for their costumes. Yeah. So did you do like a day of super fittings for all the background? How did you manage uh, that? We did, we did almost two weeks. Wow. Two weeks uh, with approximately 30 people a day. 30 That's people just... a day. And so we had two shops. We had a shop that was just for main cast. And then we had another shop once we started Vegas that was just for Vegas. So we had a costume department that was over 50 people in the shop, in the two shops. Yeah, that's a really large group of uh, individuals working. Um, I was just going to ask you, uh, so I know that you've worked with some really, like in this show, there's some big name uh, actors in the cast. So is there anyone that you were sort of like going into this? I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm terrified to work with that person. Um. To be honest with you, that's such a tough, that's such a tough question because for me, it's not so much about the actor, it's about connecting with them. 
And to me, that's my biggest thing on any show is I want to build that connection with them because once I've built that connection, there's a beautiful flow that happens. But I, I think for me, um, I think on this show, it would have to be Whoopi. Yeah, that's what I was going yeah, to say. If, I, if I was on the show, I'd be terrified to work with her. I wasn't, I wasn't and terrified. I wasn't terrified. I To me, when we found out it was going to be Whoopi, it was such an honor. And I have so much respect for her. And uh, I was just so excited to work with her. But it was also really important that I nailed the look and I had a connection with her. So when I was working with Josh, who has who's had a, um, a relationship with uh, Whoopi for years, you know, him and I started talking about the costumes and 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 how we wanted to portray Mother Abigail. And of course, we part of our 500 visual boards. We had six boards: these beautiful mood boards, uh, fabrics, color palette for her. Um, inspiration of how we saw Mother Abigail. And, you know, he, Josh is like, you've nailed it. Now it's time to talk to Whoopi. So, you know, here I am, I'm emailing Whoopi and I'm saying, introducing myself to her. And, uh, you know, the conversation started to flow. I started to show her stuff. And, you know, the first email she sends me back, she's like, I like it. I like it a lot. And she signs off with W. So I'm like, oh, thank, you know, like, oh, that's thank amazing. God, like, you know, we, we started this connection and, you know, basically I was given her measurements and over, I had the most amazing uh, building team and cutters and sewers. And we basically built her over, um, over eight weeks uh, a closet. So everything that you see that Whoopi wears is 100, 100% made. We had people who were knitting for us. Uh, we were, had people who were doing antique pleading for us. So it, every piece that was brought in was made for her. So when she came in, uh, she came in to come in for a fitting for her glasses and her prop pieces and her costumes. And that was probably the one time that I was so nervous and we had everything set up for her. And I had my head cutter with me. I had three assistant designers on the show and we I had one of them with us and we had everything out like a beautiful store for her, you know, everything set up for her, all the illustrations that she approved and all the costumes. And, um, you know, we're, we're expecting that she's going to try everything. On, we'll try, start trying things on. And she's like, Angelina, she gave me a hug. And she's like, I like this. I like this. I like this. I like this, this, this. And then she said, okay, we're done. Oh, wow. And I said, and I remember look, and she goes, we got it. And I said, okay, so are we going to try these on? And she said, no. And I said, pardon me. I, and I, she said, no. She goes, I can tell you've made them properly. I can tell that the construction is great. I know they're going to fit. She just tried on two pairs of shoes that she loved. I was going to say, did she at least try shoes on? Because that's, that's usually a thing. She tried the two shoe pairs of shoes on and she left. And I remember wow. going, I sit standing there going, oh my God. And the producer said, you nailed it. Congratulations. And then it's first day of going to set. And they put in on the call sheet extra timing for me. And I remember going, okay, I had three sewers there, two sewing machines set up on the truck. We've never Just in tried, case, we've never you don't tried know. anything on. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this is a note on how professional she is and how long she's been doing this. And, and, and people have to also remember, we spent eight weeks emailing each other back and forth, showing fabric swatches. I, I sent her illustrations and actual fabric swatches to her at home and stuff. So she saw everything prior, but she's such a pro. She didn't even have to try anything on. She just knew 
this is going to work, fit, fit, fit. And so then we're on this day, they gave me the extra time. And I remember she brings her own bus. And I remember knocking on the bus saying, hi, you know, hi, Whoopi. And uh, she said, come on in. And my head cutter and I went in. And uh, I said, okay, well, let's get the, the cost, you know. And she had a six hour prosthetics she had to go through. And I said, well, we're just gonna try it on quickly. And, you know, this is her dream sequence costume that we use the as asymmetrical lines, um, the blues for her. And I said, well, we're just gonna try it on quickly. And if we have to do any nip or tucks, we can do it. And she said, no. And then she's like, she goes, I think I'm okay. She's like, why don't we sit down and talk? So I ended up sitting with Whoopi for 20 minutes, talking about life, talking mm -hmm. about politics, talking about just everything you could even imagine and not trying on the costume. So I remember I get off the bus and, uh, you know, everybody's like, okay, is it a fin? She's, I'm like, she, she didn't, she didn't try it on. And uh, afterwards she went back to prosthetics and then I met her back at her truck. I got her dress. Every single thing fit like a glove. Wow. It was, it was such, I remember just the sweat coming down our faces because we were like, you know, and, and as everybody knows, as a costume designer, you never want a whole camera. Yep. You never want a whole camera because time is money. And she knew this was going to fit. She didn't, she did, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't waste time. And her professionalism was just top notch. And uh, I remember she kind of gave me a wink and she goes, good job. And I remember getting in the car and bringing her to set and establishing the costume. And, you know, it, that was like, that was our day one. And that was what set the tone for the whole show. She set the tone. She set the professionalism. And every, you know, she was supposed to play this part in the original adaptation. And I guess at that time she wasn't. Oh, okay. able to. I didn't know that. I was going to say, actually, I was doing some research about Edith Head. And Edith Head had a, a mishap with Marlena Dietrich. No, sorry. It was with... Um, uh, all about Eve and she did a fitting right before they were supposed to get a camera and the dress didn't fit. Uh -huh. um, Betty Davis, sorry, it was Betty Davis. And so she panicked and was like, oh my gosh, I have to go tell them to hold the camera because it's not ready. And then Betty Davis sort of just shimmied down the dress and uh -huh. they just did a couple of stitches and it was perfect. And she went and did this, uh, the scene. And so I was just thinking that that would have been like, you know, not knowing the day of, oh my gosh, is this going to work or not? And she's our lead. And she's, she's your lead, lead. She's exactly. Our number one, and we're setting the whole tone for the whole season on this show. And it just, yeah, it was like the gods were around me, and everybody was just like, yes. And when Mother Abigail walked onto set on set, it was just there was a magical moment, right? And there was this, you know, and we our first day of shooting was on Friday, September the thirteenth which is what Stephen King wanted us. We were supposed to start, we were supposed to shoot on a different date, a couple days later. And Stephen's like, no, nope, we're going to shoot on Friday the 13th. Wow. So it was just, it was, it was just a, a magical experience for us. Now I have to ask this question yeah. because, uh, you know, my viewers will want to know what it was like to work with the gorgeous Alexander Skarsgård, who I'm a huge fan of. I love true blood. So what was it like to work with him? I'm dying to know. Oh, you know what? Alex is just such a lovely man. Uh, very down to earth. Uh, again, when I talk about professionalism on the show with this huge cast, so professional and um, just a real delight to work with. And I actually have a really awesome story about Alex and the creating of his character. Um, is when, when we started working on this character, on flag it was really important that we this was the one character that i was saying before stephen king wanted to be part of because we've got 30 years of artwork of dark man and flag and you know the original uh look for him in the 70s and that was one of the things was we wanted to keep it 
they wanted to keep it exactly the same. So we, we you know, we started looking at all the artwork that had been done over the years. Um, we looked at Charles Starkweather, a uh, serial killer from, from the 50s. Um, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of fabrics, uh, samples and designs of different denims, right? Because, you know, as I, as I state, and Alex uh, signed uh, um, my illustration at the end saying to my favorite costume designer who designed my Canadian tuxedo. And it was, you know, it's the Canadian tuxedo. It's a three piece denim outfit. And it was so important because he wears this for 90% of the show. Stay tuned because there is another beautiful costume that we built for him. But it was important that it made sense and that it works. So, you know, I we we get the phone call saying Alex is 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 been casted as flag and a heads up, he's gonna be here in 48 hours to do a costume fitting. And I remember going, oh my God, this is Alex. First of all, it's Alexander Skarsgard. And I had a quick, you know, phone call with him. And he's like, yes, yes, Angelina, I love where you're going with this. And then the next thing I knew, we had a team in Los Angeles ready to shop. I had people sourcing in New York. And then we had a full team of shoppers in Vancouver. And so basically, we just shop for two days straight. I had people fly in from LA to bring everything that we brought. And we had over six rolling racks full of jean jackets jeans, uh, denim shirts. We had probably about 30 or 40 pairs of boots. So it was like we had, again, everything set up. And this Alex comes in, and I still remember he had a T-shirt, shorts on, flip-flops, you know. Did you do his fitting in L.A. or did you do it in uh, Vancouver? Vancouver. He was oh, okay. he, he, he was he, wearing flip-flops in Vancouver? It was September. Don't oh, September. Oh, okay. I'm thinking it was cold. It's it's warmer where you are. I'm in Toronto. It's a bit chillier here. Oh in yeah, yeah. September is a is usually a beautiful month, and so he came in, and you know, of course, I've got the producers there, and Josh is like, okay, like this is the costume Stephen King has to you know approve, and I said okay. So Alex comes in, gives me a big hug. And, uh, you know, I introduced him to everyone. We get him set up in the fitting. And I think he was blown away how much denim was in this fitting room. Like, it was just denim, denim, denim. And I walked him through the stuff. And uh, he's like, okay, I'll try this on. I'll try this and this. And I said, great, we've got something that we that both of us really loved. And that was one of the things that Josh did was he really wanted me as a costume designer. And this is such a beautiful uh, privilege and opportunity on a show. And I think a lot of costume designers will relate to this is when they allow the costume designer to have the freedom and to build a relationship with an actor mm -hmm. and create the costume together so that it's not coming from one person and saying, okay, this is the look. It was a collaboration. And that was every costume was how it was done on the show, which was a, a really a beautiful thing to have happen. And so then Alex, you know, going back to Alex, he tries the costume on and uh, he comes out and all of us just kind of looked and said, there's flag. It was one shot, tried the costume yeah. on. And that's what he's wearing in the show. What the he's wearing he's in the on. show. And we took, we, we altered it to slim it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. We cuffed the bottom of the pants. We flipped up the, the collar and gave it a, just a little bit of a, to, just to give it a bit more timeless and a bit of a rockabilly, rock and roll, edgy influence to it. And uh, so and then I said, Alex, do you know? We photographed it, the different stages of how this costume would be. And I said, okay, Alex, do you want to, let's try something else, right? You know? And he's like, no. He's like, we did it. And I said, are you sure? And I'm like, he's like, yes, 100%. And so I called the producers in. They came in. And Josh just kind of shook Alex's hand and said, we've got flag. 
And we took a photo, we sent it to Stephen King. And I remember just like, just praying, praying that we, know, because this is going to be what's going to be on the cover, oh, of yeah. the, the, you know, the DVD, the, you know, and the posters, all the major promo. You know, I even said to my husband, we're going to see this next Halloween. People oh, want yeah. to dress as flag. So it was important that we nailed it. And uh, we got a response right away back from Stephen King saying, You've, you guys done it. Congratulations. We've got our flag. So again, our, our two major characters who who basically, you know, uh, set the platform for everyone else, Whoopi Goldberg and Alexander Skarsgård. So her, yeah, like, I, it was a, it was an honor for me. And um, for all your did, viewers, did he try hit the boots on and the belt and everything at the same time, like the that belt buckle, like the scorpion? Yes. So we actually created and designed that. So mm -hmm. if you to to know a little bit more about the the scorpion is Randall Flagg um, in the film has control over creatures. So he's got control over the ravens. He's got control over the wolves. He's got control over the rats that we've seen so far throughout the episodes. And he also has control over the scorpion and scorpion if you look up, represents fear, intimidation, and ability to control. So that was, you know, this concept came up right at the very beginning. We knew we were going to have a scorpion buckle. I worked with an artist, and then I had someone um, build the actual buckle for him. Yeah, I love it. It's just stunning. So did you have to go back then and make multiples of his outfit, or, or do you just did you just go with the one? Uh, we had, and I, I have to thank my amazing team who did all the alterations and breakdown team. We had over 30 of these costumes. So we had probably about 18 for Alex. And then, so maybe we had closer to 40. We probably had another 20 for stunts and photo doubles and for ripping and aging and adding blood. And, you know, so it's, it's important that to look at it, and I think a lot of people when they're viewing something, they don't realize this, is that you need multiples of these costumes. And he's mm -hmm. wearing it from the very beginning of episode one, you know, further on into the episodes. So it's important that we show the different stages of that costume and his travels and things that have happened to him. Well, let, why don't we talk about Julia Lowry? Um, she's yeah. also, yeah, she's, I mean, again, you know, it's like the, you've got the goodies and you've got the baddies and the baddies are so much more juicy and fun. Right. So do you want to tell me a little, <laughs> Absolutely. So, I always enjoyed the baddies. So do you want to tell me a little bit about her costume and her arc, uh, costume wise? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things is with Julie Larry, uh, I believe in the, in the novel, she's a teenager. And of course we've made her a little bit older in this film, but basically she's a self- absorbed uh, small town girl and again you know we talk about 99.4 percent of the world is gone and she's on her own and you know excuse me for my language but she's like fuck it i'm gonna go live my life i'm gonna do what i want i'm by myself i'm gonna wear whatever i desire whatever jewelry i want and you know we we had fun with it we wanted uh, julie to feel like she lived in this fantasy world in a depart in a department store, and uh, so you know we we pitched the idea of a big puffy dress and throwing it on with a hip hop hat and crazy jewelry with a faux fur jacket and you know inspired like Jean Paul Gaultier high boots you know and. Uh, it was, you know, it was fun. We wanted it to be playful. That so when when we see Nick and we see Tom Collin and they see this girl, you're like, what the? You know what I mean? Like, what's going with a shotgun? <laughs> yeah, with a Spoiler shotgun. alert. <laughs> and so yeah. you know, we, we we see this side of this you know person, and then we bring her into Vegas, and she becomes even more narcissistic. And now she realizes that she can control men with her sexuality and that she's got this desire of wanting to be with Flag, And of course, she's with Lloyd and, and employing all of this 
together. And so it was important that, you know, and then we found out that her hair was going to be pink. And I wanted to play off of that. I wanted yeah. to play off of that as much as possible. And uh, we built 90% of her costumes. And uh, we just had a lot of fun sketching out different ideas. And, you know, I was inspired by a lot of stuff that I saw in Vegas. And uh, we wanted to tailor everything. We wanted everything to have a lot of texture to it, a lot of vibrance to it, flirty, uh, you know, a feeling of, you know, she's her own goddess in this in this whacked up crazy world. And she and she has a way of controlling people around her without even having to do anything. Yeah. And, you know, and it was important to play off of that. Yeah, I love her costumes, especially. Okay, just to let everyone know, I've only seen that uh, the fifth episode. I haven't seen uh, the sixth episode, which is actually airing today, like as we're yes. recording this. Uh, oh, yeah. So one of my viewers actually noticed this detail. I noticed it as well. So at that one, there's one scene when Nick and Tom are wearing matching jackets, and I know that you said something about that on Instagram. So you know those striped jackets. It kind yes. of had almost like a a little bit of an '80s bomber jacket feel. I don't know. Like, w tell me a little bit about that. That was a really cool detail well you know first of first of all you, you, you understanding tom collins character and where he's been and i love him so much by the way i just want to give uh, him a big hug he's just adorable and i love by the way i love his dolly parton shirt it's just yes, the coolest you know, shirt ever. That, that's probably one of the most interesting stories is his dolly parton shirt because uh, I'll, I'll go very quickly through this sure we basically when we were coming up with tom collins this will lead to the jacket which all your viewers will want to know about is you know, dealing with 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 Tom Collin and you know, uh, dealing with the, 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 his mental and his ability to communicate with everyone around him, it was important for us to figure out what are we going to do and make sure that we didn't copy what was done in the '90s. Right? It was very important, and you know, a lot of studies had shown that there's that a lot of people have security blankets. And we were like, okay, what is Tom Collins' security blanket? And, uh, you know, um, I'm sitting there with Josh and um, he's like, you know, what about a band t-shirt? And I'm like, I love it. I love it. So I, I remember going home that night and my family, I have a four and a six year old. They love listening to vinyl records. And uh, we're a huge Dolly Parton fan. Huge Dolly Parton fan. So we're listening to Jolene. And I remember I had been reading about Dolly, how um, she has her own site and she reads to children and she's created these books and stuff. And and it's a comfort zone. And that the fact that my children just fall into this dream world with her and it's a comfort. And so I remember going, okay, I'm going to take this back to Josh. And I said, Josh, what do you think about Dolly? And he's like, yes. And so we started getting into it. And luckily for Josh, he had a connection because as, as many people know, it's very hard to get music t-shirts on to camera. There's a lot of legal things that happen with it. And we, oh, I've lost your voice. Sorry, no, I was gonna say, that's interesting. I didn't know that, but there's legal implications Huge. there huge legal to get into having a music band t-shirt so anyways he had a connection and i remember getting on the phone with uh brad hankey and saying what do you think about this idea you know dolly's from the south them hear music and everything he's like angelina i loved it and so i sent him a couple samples we picked something that we were all happy dolly parton's uh team approved it which was awesome so, and so that began the beginnings of his uniform. So anyways, then we show this beautiful relationship between him and Nick and the bond that's created. And of course, if you read the book, you have a better understanding of who these two characters were and the journey that they've taken together. So it was really important for me to show that. And I remember I, I bought this jacket. And again, when you look at it, it's your primary colors. And again, very easy to relate to. And I thought to myself, okay, like, I really like this jacket. And I remember going, what about Nick and Tom Collin? 
And I remember pitching in this idea saying, I love the idea when they're saying goodbye to each other and we're sending Tom Collin off to Vegas and Nick is saying goodbye, that it's a bond between the two of them saying, you know, I, we're not to, we may not be together, but there's something that holds us together, right? And, and our journey that we've taken on with one another. So I pitched this idea of this Jack that Tom would have found in Boulder and had given, uh, you know, and gotten one for Nick. And of course, Nick wears it the day that he says goodbye to his, to his best friend, showing how much his relationship with him is important. So, you know, and, and, and again, we took a risk on that because, you know, some people would have said, this is kind of a joke. It's funny. It doesn't work, but it worked. And when I watched the scene and I saw it and I'm like, yes, we made the right decision. So again, that's a small piece where, again, we're getting into the, you know, instead of just designing costumes, we're getting into the, the mental states and the emotions of these characters and that they actually are human and real, right? Yeah, I absolutely loved it. It's kind of like, you know, when you have that that heart necklace and then each of you takes a piece right, of the yes. heart necklace and you're yeah. sort of going your own. Yeah, and and you're you you're, you're you're just praying hoping that they'll come back together again. I haven't read the book, so I don't know. I'm really hoping they are. <laughs> okay, so for fun, one last question I'm just going to ask you. Um uh Besides all the costumes that you've talked about so far, which character was your favorite to costume besides, yeah, sorry. What was your favorite to costume besides any of the ones we've talked about? Oh, sorry, that's, I know it's a difficult one. Oh my I'm putting God. You on the spot. That is, that is, you know, there's so many costumes on the show and there's so many casts on the show. And, you know, and the fact that each of these characters had to be different was just crazy you know to be honest with you vegas was just so much fun for me and creating all these characters and giving each of them you know their their little bit of piece of individuality and i i have to say you know for me it was rat woman you know yeah. it was exciting when i found out it was going to be a woman it was not going to be a man i love that idea was it a man was, in the book uh, yes, that character. Okay, see, I haven't read the book, so it's a man in the book, and mm -hmm. and a male person plays it in the first adaptation. And I never, so just to let you know, I only watched twenty minutes of the first adaptation because I'm like, I can't. If I go there, I'm going to start to want to relate my costumes. I to absolutely them. understand that. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, so it was Rat Woman. I'm like, she's a ringleader. She works for Flag. You know, and how do we make her costumes different from everyone else? And of course, you know, building this headpiece, I looked at, you know, a leader and I looked at dragoons and I said, yes, we are going to build her a dragoon, a modern dragoon uh, mohawk mm -hmm. that was over four feet tall. And, you know, and just, you know, and went from there and started to create the character. And the, the same with Lloyd and Bobby Terry, Julie, just all of these people, they were, they were fun characters to play, right? Fun characters to play. So it was important that we gave them a costume that they were excited about. And, you know, every person that came in for a fitting left excited and we're like, yes, I feel the character. So to me, that was the most exciting part about the job was having that relationship with this amazing cast and helping them create their characters and tell a story that is probably one of the hardest stories to tell in, in nine episodes and hard for people not to compare it to the book oh, yeah. and not try to compare it to the adaptation right and 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 hopefully people come in with an open mind and remember it's 2020 yeah see i've never read the book my sister has and she's like oh gosh i probably she probably read it like 30 years ago i'm not even sure what you said what year it came out like 1974 i believe yeah. So she said, oh, I think that might be worth a reread. And I think that's probably what will happen after people watch this. They'll probably want to go back and watch, reread the book, um, especially with Stephen King. He seems to be like, he's on like a hot new revival here. He's got like, you know, all these shows, adaptations being he's done. Brilliant. Yeah. So before I leave you, um, I just wanted to ask what you've been, you're working on next uh, before, uh, 
after this show is done, obviously this is in the can and you've got some, I know you have some other projects you're doing. One of them I'm kind of excited about. Um, to be honest with you right now, I, um, I've kind of decided with COVID and because of my little ones to take a little bit of time for myself and, uh, which has been a really, um, amazing time because on the stand, I was pretty much on the show for a year and, uh, our crew pretty much works six days a week. And, uh, my hours were quite long. So I'm happy to be at home and be re-inspired uh, by new things. So I'm, I've, got, I've got a few projects that are uh, coming up and, and then I'll be deciding on which one I will be taking sometime in the spring or summertime and dedicate the next year of my life to a new project. Yeah, hopefully, um, you know, we're in Canada. So hopefully, uh, everyone will, you know, by this by the spring, fall kind of thing, be vaccinated, and everyone will be able to get back to some sort of normal life, but it probably won't happen for some time, right? Yeah. And you know, for us, when we finished the show, it was March, I think it was March 13th, we shut the doors down. And it was like, I can't believe this is happening, you know, and, and let your, you know, for viewers to understand, we had been, we just spent a year studying and learning and educating, you know, about viruses and pandemics and how it affects people and what are, what it does to you. And then for all of a sudden, you know, like, Things started to change in that last three weeks of shooting. And we started hearing on the news all about, you know, the coronavirus. And then the next thing you know, we're like, okay, we finished shooting and we got to shut our doors because of COVID-19. It was just, it was, yeah, a, um, yeah. It, was, it was a strange experience. And it's interesting how the world aligns itself uh when you're in something and then all of a sudden you're like oh my god this is a world i've just lived for the last year and now we're going through it in reality yeah absolutely it's sort of strange especially like considering the stand like i mean you were doing the stand before you even knew we were heading into a pandemic yes. so that must have been completely surreal for you right <laughs> That's really, i remember i remember sitting down and watching episode one with my husband and uh, I remember him just putting his hand on his on his forehead and go, I cannot believe this. Like mm -hmm. how how perfect the timing is and how much time you spent on this and look at this. Like is, is that he's like unbelievable. And yeah, it was unbelievable for all of us, the whole crew and, and the and the cast. But again, you know, in the end, you know, when you talk with the showrunners and you, you look at the book. It's it also relates to what we're seeing in society It's about, you know, making a choice, good or bad. Right. And yeah. you know, we're seeing that right now in politics. Right. And uh, it's just yeah, it's it's amazing. You know, Stephen King was ahead of his time. Totally. He totally was. And um, well, anyway, Angelina, I want to thank you so much. Um, I know that you're on Instagram. So if people want to come and follow your work, is that a good place for them to check out your work? Or do you Absolutely. have a website? Absolutely. And I will also have my website, my new website, which I've been working on for the last uh, couple months, will be launching out. And uh, there will be lots of behind the scene pics from the stand and fitting photos of the cast. And um, yeah. I'm open to always welcome. And, you know, I've got people who want to find out more. I'm always welcome to uh, hearing people's comments or where we've done things. And yeah. Yeah. So I'll put a, a link to that in the description. And if anybody wants to come find you, by the way, I want to say that's one thing that I love so much about social media nowadays is that uh, we have access to the costume designers and we get to see like a lot of the cool behind the scenes type things that you share. Um, you know, either before or after the show is up. So, um, but I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day and coming and chatting with me. It's been so fun to get to know thank you. you. It's, yeah. And, and again, I just, I, I hope it shows in my expressions how passionate I am about this project and how honored I was. And, you know, for all your viewers, every single cast member was just 
amazing and it really was a costume designer's dream job for me um just to be have the ability to create these two worlds well, I really appreciate it. And I, I'm so excited to see, like, there's nine episodes, so I have four more to go. Can't wait to see it. It's too bad it's just a limited run, like it can't carry on. But sometimes uh, um, these types Better of shows have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to this oh, yeah, one. There's an end. We don't need to go into season two, three, and four. Let's, let's let, 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 let the viewers have their time. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Have a great day.